Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Joanne, Joanne Bagshaw, uh, a fellow adoptee and a relationship therapist. Lovely to see you, Joanne. Looking forward to this. Thank you, Simon. Thrilled to be here. Yeah. I was saying, because like you're in the States and uh, when when I saw the name, right, Bagshaw, I thought that that sounds like a Yorkshire kind of a name. Have you? Yes. Yeah. You know, it, it is a British name. It is a British name. And um, it's it's not an accident because I in my as I could tell from doing my DNA testing um, and finding my birth family, I am in part British. Um, and when I was adopted, I'm a domestic adoptee in the United States, uh, adopted out of foster care um, in 1968. Um, you know, their goal was to match adoptees with a family that resembled what they knew about the birth family. And so it's not an accident that I wound up in a family with uh, British roots because it's similar to my own birth family. Yeah, we, we have, a, we don't have, I, I think we have, a bra- you know, we have uh, Bagshaws, but we have Brayshaws, lots of Brayshaws. It's a very kind of a Yorkshire-ish name or yeah. Bradshaw. But then there's Carrie Bradshaw, isn't that on Sex in the City? And oh, that's Bradshaw. Yeah, Carrie Bradshaw. Bradshaw. I don't know if Bradshaw is British. No. So, um, yeah, so 68. Were you born in 68 then, or were you? I was born in 68. I know, it's shocking. It is. It's, very shocking. <laughs> it's shocking to me. <laughs> shocking to me. Because I'm just a year older than you. Yeah, I'm 60, born in 67. Yeah. 67. So uh, Joanne and I spoke last uh, week and we, we, we were talking about the kind of the essential, one of the essential issues of us adoptees uh, and, and this, this belief that there's something wrong with us. And a lot of your work, I understand, John, has been, um, it, it, it's, it's rethinking that because it's not about what's wrong with me or what's wrong with us but it's about what's wrong with the, the family system. So with the family system. Mm-hmm. Family system. So that's kind of what that's our starting point for today. So what 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 do you mean by that? Why is that so big for you? Sure. So uh, just I want to add a little context. So in addition to being a relationship therapist, I also work with adoptees and um, around uh, issues with reunion, um, search and reunion, and I am an adoptee in reunion. And um, in, in all of my training and clinical experience and personal experience, the, the way that I see uh, adoption from a systemic point of view is that something um, went awry in, the, in a family system. Like it's not the natural order of things to relinquish a child. And um, so something must have gone awry in that system. Um, Somebody else's unresolved trauma led to an adoptee of an infant being relinquished, right? And so that, so our adoption is, you know, in part a a result of someone else's um, unprocessed trauma that was somewhere in the family tree, right? Families are complicated, so it might not even be uh, beginning with the birth parent, but the grandparents, uncles, aunts. So their trauma is projected onto us, right, in, in, in just rel- relinquishing us. Plus, our adoptive parents have trauma. Um, it, it may be unprocessed. Uh, it may be around fertility, their own loss and grief around fertility issues or whatever led them uh, in many cases to adopt. I know that there's a wide variety of different types of adoptions. Um, but then we also have our own trauma of the relinquishment. And that is a lot of trauma and a lot of systemic failure, right? To support an infant that, you know, it's put on a baby. And so we grow up internalizing all of this trauma. What's wrong with me? Why am I defective? Why was I given up? And um, I think that, you know, in that belief, it's us internalizing a systemic failure 
and other people's traumas and confusing it with our own trauma, right? And so it gets very messy and very complicated and confusing, especially when, when we're older and as adults and we're trying to reunite with birth families um, who often still haven't resolved that trauma. And so we, we're entering back into a system that has a problem and usually hasn't been talked about or worked on or addressed. And it becomes very messy at times yeah. and complicated at least. So is, is that, that, that first kind of that transition uh, or transmission, sorry, I mean the transmission of the trauma, is that what people talk about as well in kind of the uh, in utero experiences? People talk about that, don't they? The fact that um, uh, where the uh, the birth mother is going through in tough times, going through going through trauma, um, and that how somehow affects us because we are part of her until That's right until the umbilical mm -hmm. cord is cut. Down. Yeah, I mean, we understand through research and epigenetics that our DNA is affected not only by our birth mother's trauma, you know, carrying us in utero, but also by our grandparents. It alters our DNA. Like we're literally carrying the genes for trauma in our DNA, plus living our own. And that's not, you know, certainly in my time growing up as an adoptee, that wasn't talked about, you know, my adoptive parents followed all the rules and guidelines about how to handle adoption, which was tell her she's adopted. It's, you know, from the beginning. So it's not a surprise. We know the trauma that happens to late discovery adoptees. Right. Um, and uh, um, to tell her that she's wanted, tell her that she's chosen. Right. So, you know, that's, I get the message behind that. We want you, you're chosen, we love you. But it still minimizes the actual fact that I went from, uh, you know, my, my mother's uterus to foster care and then to another family. And, you know, that has implications. That's tra traumatic. And so we, we have a better understanding of that today. Um, but still, I think you know, for many of the adoptees that I'm working with are still carrying all of this trauma and shame and secret keeping um, for their birth families. It's like an agreement made. I won't talk about it with you. I won't confront you. I won't speak about it. Um, and, and we're carrying this around and it's not actually our own trauma that we're carrying in that respect. Yeah. So there's also, there's that, you're alluding to what is for many adoptees, um, and this isn't actually my experience, but I, I see it on social. I hear it from others when I'm talking to. There's this fundamental clash between um, being told that we're, we're special and that we're mm. wanted, but feeling exactly the opposite of that being told one thing but feeling another so the what's the word the, the, is it dissonance is that cognitive right? dissonance very dissonance. good it's a as clash. a psychology professor i'm very proud <laughs> it's cognitive a, it, dissonance yeah exactly it is, it is a, clash a clash in what we believe yeah and and but that clash we get more that adds to it that like um but in in this, uh, I'll, so I'll relate this to something that happened to to me, uh, something that I did, uh, which was um, so when my my dad was diagnosed with cancer uh, and died about six years ago, he it, it was a very short time between the diagnosis and and his death, six weeks maybe, very late diagnosis. I was getting. Uh, the the hospital weren't great. Um, there's some there's some uh, very poor communication and lots of stuff going on, and I was getting very riled up about that. And I was actually making the situation worse, right? So 
it was it was on I wasn't viewing at this as uh, I wasn't giving the hospital staff any grace, you know, like I was I, I was going through a tricky time because of the because of the impact of his impending death. But I was actually making the situation worse by getting very riled up about it. Mm. And, um, so, but what I see is uh, you've got uh, what I see amongst uh, adoptees is them doing the same thing. So they've got this dissonance between how they're told they're told to to feel and how they feel, and then they get they they rile themselves up about this about this. A clash in the same way as I riled myself up until I spotted until I spotted what was happening. I was started the spotted was was happening, you know, that that kind of like self-awareness piece. I realized that I was making this I was making the situation worse. I was turning the um uh, yeah I was turning I, I was bringing up the storm in the teacup, you know. Um so uh, have you got anything if yeah, I mean, it's, cra it's crazy making, I think, you know, it's yeah. crazy making where, um, you know, as a, adoptees, certainly in my experience, um, we lose our entire families at birth and our identities at birth. And then we're, you know, expected to just sort of not grieve, not grieve, not grieve at all, not talk about it, accept it and move on and pretend it didn't happen. And we're grieving the loss of our families, you know, for the rest of our lives, in a sense. Even if we reunite, we're still missing out on that history. You know, adoptees are pretty clear today, uh, you know, and we understand, like, adoption isn't a better life, it's a different life. Right? And so, but we still, we're, we're carrying this grief about what could have been relationships we could have had and that we're trying to rebuild now in this complicated, you know, family system. Um, but, you know, what you're saying doesn't surprise me because it sounds like complicated compounded grief. You know, we, we get very triggered by grief because we're grieving. You know, we, we've learned to just carry that around, you know, since birth. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is crazy making. And sometimes we're the one that's making crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's sometimes it's done. Um, and funny you should say about the grief thing. Um, I remember, uh, I, I remember the the first, my yeah, the death of my the first death of somebody close to me, which was my um, granddad when I was about seven, and. Uh, I, and the my, my teddy bear, the, the the famous teddy bear that I talked about, he he was my solace. Like mm -hmm. I went to tell I went to tell my teddy bear about the the death of my granddad, and I That's was sweet. Uh, sorry yeah. About, yeah. on that. Yeah, um, I, I, but I there's a few other there's some other times when I've been at a low point where grief has hit me far harder than. I might have expected in in other times. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the this this idea that you talk a, a, a lot about supporting adoptees or insertion and reunion, and the fact that the 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 there's still something very awry with the within the birth family, which is what makes that process extra difficult it gives another layer well i would say it's probably is that the foundation is this the foundation point of the difficulty is the fact that i think it's part of it and i think you know it, it's it's not always true but it's often true that that in the birth family whatever went awry hasn't been resolved or healed or, or talked about and i also want to point that sometimes it's it's happening in the in the larger culture Right. When we think about interna international adoptions, you know, why, 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 for instance, do Americans, you know, adopt so many children from other countries? How, you know, what's failing in this system, right? And 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 we we hear that the pain of international adoptees 
um, who, you know, lost their identity, family and culture. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the family and also the larger culture. I just want to, you know, include like we're, we're really considering the whole system. But, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to an individual adoptee, um, you know, the pain, of course, is, is, is on an individual level, like, we're, you know, we're in the moment and the complications about the reunions and the shame that maybe um, the birth, some members of the birth family feel. And of course, families are made up of individuals and, and there may be people in that family system who have come to terms or have done work on themselves, who are welcoming, welcoming the adoptee. And then there may be people who haven't done that. And, you know, it, 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 can, it can look differently in every family constellation, right? Like who's done the work and who hasn't. Um, but I think what's hard for the adoptee is to sort of suss out, like, do I belong? And do, did, I, did I screw things up? Should I have reunited? This person doesn't want me, but this person does. You know, what's happening? And I like to keep things like this, you know, try to keep things clear and focused. Um, you know, my perspective is that we, we do belong. We, we have a right um, to, to know our birth families, to identify them, to contact them. Um, this is our lineage. Like we never consented to losing them. So, so you know, but, but how do you do that in a way that's relational, right? You can't just storm in and be like, I have a right to be here and I claim you. Um, so, so how do we do that in a way that, um, that builds connections? But, you know, maybe sometimes setting boundaries, especially if there are unhealthy people in that family system. So, so my job is helping adoptees navigate that journey. How do we do this in a way that's adoptee focused and centered on the needs of the adoptee, which doesn't often happen, you know, certainly not agencies where they're focused on the adoptive parents. I mean, and that's another issue Like we're talking about the birth families. How does the adoptive family feel about the the search and reunion. Often the adoptees that I work with feel very much in the middle, trying to, um, you know, not upset the adoptive family, maybe setting family uh, boundaries with um, birth families who are, you know, maybe really excited about the reunion and, uh, you know, sort of like swooping in, you know, so, so what does the adoptee need? And sort of helping them stay focused on what's best for them and their own needs because we're not conditioned to do that, right? As adoptees in general, you know, I hate to generalize my opinions for every adoptee, we all have different circumstances, but you know, in general, we're sort of like attuned to balancing the needs of all the different families. That's sort of our job as being adoptees, right? We solve somebody's need in the birth family to relinquish. We're here so serving a need of, fertility needs oftentimes for adoptive families, you know, but what about us? So that's how I'm that's helping right. people navigate that. So what's coming to, to my mind is uh, a book I read on emotional intelligence about probably about 20 years ago. This is the sort of thing I used to do. And this the thing I still do on holiday. I read a book about emotional intelligence on holiday. Um, uh, the idea was that it would be make me a better boss, okay? Because I had a, a staff, I had a, a five or six people working for me. Um, I don't know whether it worked. I would think probably not. I wasn't a very great boss. It's a lot easier without having any staff. Um, for me, anyway. <laughs> um, so the um, uh, you know when we look at emotional intelligence, it starts with us. So mm -hmm. what, what what I I guess that. Because of all the complexities that you've uh, you've mentioned, um, and the uncertainties that you mentioned, and the other people involved in it, so what would seem to me to, to be it, so we can't actually give you a roadmap. We can't give you a roadmap. This isn't like a chemistry experiment where we're going to say right. this, this is this is my uh, you know this is my equipment list and this is my methodology. Step one, step two, step three. We can't do that because this involves human beings. So it would seem to me that the, 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 
the only place that we have any agency is over ourselves. So this is really about us being in uh, a, a best, a better place ourselves, mm-hmm. so that we can ride the emotional roller coaster of union mm-hmm. in a more uh, adept and yeah safe fashion exactly and i think you uh, hit the nail on the head with it there's no roadmap there is no roadmap like we have a we're not really great you know understanding step families but i think we have a solid understanding about different roles and step families and conflicts and there's research but we don't really have that for adoptees in reunion there's no roadmap for that and you know, adoptees that try to do this work with non-adoptee therapists struggle because non-adoptee therapists, you know, can empathize. But unless you've really lived this journey a little bit, it's extremely challenging. And you know, I know that there are adoptive parents who are therapists who have lived some of this and can be helpful. Um, but it's not the same as talking to another adoptee. And, uh, you know, and that's staying with the adoptee focus um, of, you know, not coming in with uh, an adoptive parent's perspective, a birth parent's perspective, but coming in with um, support and solid advice and wisdom from another adoptee, you know, makes a lot of difference. Yeah. So um, if we take a step back, because obviously there's the, the bigot, the the bigger issue here is you know the 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 layer of trauma and i was just i was thinking trauma cubed right so t to the yeah. three, not not trauma squared it's trauma from the birth mother uh, uh our own trauma and then the trauma of the adoptive parent especially the fertility stuff the morning of uh, of, the, of the loss of by a, have a loss of a biological or the ability to have a biological child so t times t times t it's t cubed um what's what where is the hope beyond you know like did we talk about this last time i i, I have a challenge i have a challenge with the bruce perry and oprah winfrey book which is mm-hmm. basically you know, mm-hmm. all it says is uh, the only hope he gives is he keeps on dropping in the word neuroplasticity, and quite frankly, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's not enough for me. I listened, I listened to that <laughs> book for eight hours, and I thought I, I mm-hmm. kept on thinking he was going to get to the point, but he didn't. Mm-hmm. And it was it was very good at saying um, it, it's not it, it's not what's wrong with you; it's what's happened to you. Absolutely. But, but then, said, what do you do? That, but but that <laughs> but that is said in one sentence, a bit like the Carol Dweck book. Have you read that book? the um, uh, growth mindset book? No, I didn't read okay. it, but I'm familiar with the research. Yeah. So it's another very long book, which essentially says, um, okay, uh, just put yet on the end of any sentence when you say that you can't do it, right? So I can't do yet. this. I don't know how to. Yet. Mm-hmm. Yet. And, and, and then move forward. So it's basically three letters. Right. Yet that's you can sum the whole book. It's powerful. But it, it's mm-hmm. yeah. But I don't need to be told that for like eleven hours. You know, like I'm listening to an audio book. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. And with Bruce Perry, I don't need to be told. It's not. I've I've got the message, Bruce. Oprah. I think I think it's great. But you, you you're going to give you're going to have to give me more hope than the word than occasionally dropping in this phrase neuroplasticity, um, because otherwise, really, your book is just a um, a, a, a a piece of promotional literature for, for, for yourself that I paid mm-hmm. to buy. So where you know, I, so I'm down seven pound fifty in my my Audible subscription, and um, you know I'm a Yorkshireman. We know I don't know if the, the the stereotype is that Yorkshire people are tight, right? They're tight with the money. Okay, okay, thank you. But, so, <laughs> so 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 where is big question big trauma trauma times three trauma cubed where where is where is the hope beyond the 
Bruce Perry spouting the word neuroplasticity. Where is the hope with us and our trauma? Well, so from an, from looking at sort of like an individual perspective, what we know about adoptees that do search and reunion, that even if it's complicated and hard, overwhelmingly, it's very helpful and po a positive experience and healing. Um, but in so what you're talking, so when we're talking about neuroplasticity, we're talking about repeated experiences that change patterns in the brain. Um, adoptees tend to have, as we know, you know, abandonment issues, right? Struggling with abandonment. We apply it to all kinds of situations. Um, working through this stuff, working, you're, you're con literally confronting your abandonment issues when you reunite with your birth family and changing some of those patterns, like, and learning to not apply um, those abandonment issues outside in other relationships, friendships, uh, romantic partners, even children. Um, those those skills help to change, uh, you know, your patterning in your brain, right? But I also coming back to the systemic point is that we have an opportunity to change the our our generational line, right? Um, in how we deal with adoption in our family, right? So, um, you know, I'm a parent and I, one of the ways that I have changed uh, in my family system is to uh, focus on being the best parent that I could be to my daughter, being solid, consistent, reliable, warm, nurturing, here, here for her all of those things that my birth mother was not uh, really allowed to. She was uh, coerced into relinquishing me. So, um, you know, in, that in itself changes a generational pattern in this tree. That is hope. That's going to change, that not only changed the DNA for my daughter, but for her children, should she have children, right? So, you know, we can, we can improve our relationships by working through this stuff directly, which is the neuroplasticity that you're talking about, but we can also change family patterns by working through this stuff directly. Yeah. So it's a doing thing, not a reading thing. It's a doing thing. You have, and if you, you can't change um, your brain patterning by reading, although it can give you ideas to do so. Um, it, reading does other marvelous things. So I'm an avid reader. Keep reading everybody. Um, but if you want to change, you know, if you want to work that neuroplasticity, so to speak, you've got to do it through experience. Um, we do that in therapy. That's uh, at the, at some of the basis of experiential therapy, you know, um, attachment focus or psychodynamic therapy, where you're actually living, maybe for some people, their very first secure attachment um, with their therapist. And that changes brain patterning. Yeah. The... Um... The, the thing that came to my mind, ah, let me change that. So, yeah, I was going to give a, a non-adoption um, example, but an adoption one's come to mind, and that's far more relevant, obviously, because that's what we're talking about. So, yeah, I, I had a, did I tell you about this? I had, like having a, a meltdown in the uh, therapist chair um, at... Uh, when she asked me a question about why I'd paused my search. And so I had this meltdown and I just thought, I'm not going to let this fear of uh, a second rejection um, stop me. So it, it was like a run through, run through the, run through the wall, run through the pain wall. That's what I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. and the pain wall was in my head, right? Mm -hmm. What, what, what mm -hmm. I found was the, the 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 truth of it, the truth that of her uh, desperate predicament in the sixties as a single mother to be the stages that uh this this what society was like in those days their view on single mothers you you mentioned the did you mention the un 
Fessler book, didn't you? I think last time we spoke. Is it Anne Fessler? Yeah. It's the it's the it, it's the um Fess Anne Fessler. It, it's about birth mothers. It's a it's a book about birth mothers. And that is reading that book shifts, I think, our well, reading my adoption family. Uh, shifted my perspective and I saw the I saw for myself that the teddy bear was a symbol of a love not mm -hmm. a consolation prize and, mm -hmm. and that so my my beliefs crumbled I well the more yeah my my belief that she didn't love me enough to effing keep me mm -hmm. that, that crumbled um those that 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 belief just went it was like a a, a a snowman that melts when the temperature goes up to minus uh, sorry when the temperature goes up to 10, 10 degrees and the sun comes out it just went right? we don't hear a lot about in the adoption world we don't hear a lot about beliefs we hear a lot about trauma but we we don't hear a lot about beliefs. I mean, I come I come from a a world, you know, it's in in the business development world, in the entrepreneurial improvement kind of world. We get into self development and you know busting self limiting beliefs, and the belief that uh, so looking back on where I was, I believed that my birth mother didn't love me enough to keep me. Right, and then mm. that's mm -hmm. when that's shown to be false. When that belief mm -hmm. is thrown out the water, then then my 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 backpack, as you would call them, my rucksack, as as we call them here in the UK, has got a lot less bricks in it. Right? Yeah. What do you? Uh, I'm a, what do you? What do you think? I'm. I'm um, what do you take of this? Uh, what do you make of this? I, sh I should say this stuff that I'm talking about, beliefs and, and trauma. Yeah, well, I think that for me, what I hear is you um, expressing, you know, your internalized belief that there was something wrong with you and uh, how that shows up, right? And that's what continues to show up for us adoptees. Like, what was wrong with me? Why didn't she want me? Why didn't they keep me? Why am I unlovable? Why am I not wanted? And though, you know, that's that's our trauma of relinquishment. And um, because in many cases, no one has really helped us process that. Um, it doesn't get, there's no interruption for these thoughts and beliefs until maybe we get older and go to therapy at whatever age. Yeah. Um, and, and how, you know, how much pain it causes us and, and cycling and relationships. Um, but that, you know, that belief, you know, feels to me like a direct line right to the trauma of relinquishment. Yeah. Like, why didn't she keep me? And the belief, I, I didn't, like, you know, you hear this, you hear these things about, um, I hear this stuff, I don't know, um, mantras and, um, you know, people uh, what do they call them? They, they look in the mirror. They, they look in the mirror. Uh, affirmations. Yeah, is, it, is that what they're right? They're yes, affirmations. affirmations. Yeah, yeah. Affirmations. So, so I didn't. I didn't have a. I didn't have an affirmation. You know, like I didn't read a book and as and 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 right. that said right as you're cleaning your teeth each morning, um, repeat your five uh, uh, affirmations. <laughs> the belief yes. that you are good. Enough, right? The belief yeah. was busted. The belief was busted through my to the a different nice experience thing. you had like a corrective experience Corrected and actually experience. i want to say you did you did have an affirmation but it was a negative affirmation right your affirmation oh, was right. she didn't want me yeah yeah. yeah yeah um and then and then your experience you know uh, you had a new experience that that changed it that was able to help you see from a different perspective yeah yeah uh, this is just about me, and it, it feels a little bit um, uh, self 
uh, whatever, whatever. I mean, what's the word? Self gratifying. Can can you put some more general stuff, or maybe bring your own stuff to this? How, how the how, can you can you generalize more about beliefs, or talk about your own belief busting? Um. Yes. You know, I think I could. I think this is interesting. So. I started off talking about, you know, my adoptive parents being told how to raise an adoptee by telling me, we wanted you, you're special, we chose you. And that in itself was an affirmation, right? So I'm, as a child, bouncing around, you know, I was adopted, and my parents chose me, and I'm special. And, you know, I was in summer camp. And I think I said something, you know, I was like, you know, probably eight. And I, I said something about um, being special because I was adopted. And a little girl looked at me and said, that doesn't mean you're special. That just meant that your mother didn't want you. And wow. oh boy, Simon, it had never occurred to me, never occurred to me. And I went to the counselor and I said, uh, you know, I was like, and just like, in like shocked I was like appalled you know and I told her what the other little girl said I think I was it wasn't I was telling her so much I think I was just looking for something somebody to say something else and she said well maybe you should should not tell people that you're adopted oh and that this must have been again, a counselor this must have been a <laughs> yeah, counselor I mean how old are camp counselors right you know 17 18 like 17, you know 18. <laughs> yeah. pretty, a lot so, of them are British. A lot, a lot of them are British. Uh, they, they, it's cheap labour. They, they. Ah, yeah. yeah. So was it a Brit? Yep. Uh, was it a Brit? Uh, no, I, I can't blame the British for this. <laughs> but, um, I think uh, she was American. First, yeah. I, yeah. Well, we're talking before about um, uh, before we started recording about how uh, nasty little little girls can be to one another oh absolutely that was pretty harsh i mean you know i don't think her intention was to be kind uh so no. you know that that definitely shaped my beliefs about adoption for a while you know uh it it, it really it took um it took until um my reunion with my birth mother's family which she had died in 1978 and I reunited with them when I was pregnant with my daughter um in 2003 um so she died young your birth mother she died. died young she died from breast cancer at age 45 and she had schizophrenia and she actually did want to keep me but her family was my family <laughs> was, um, you know, comfortable and uh, embarrassed and, you know, were unsure how I would turn out. You know, there's a lot of complications that go into that. Plus she was single and, but it took, you know, it took until I really could understand. And I, I finally got the social workers um, notes. She wanted me and that, was profound yeah. and she she said the words and the social workers were so careful to write exactly what she said she wrote i'll never forget that i was a mother and i didn't find that out until i was in my 30s right so it was a long time of carrying this shame of not being wanted which wasn't even true yeah yeah. And my story is not unique. And it's, you know, this is typical. Like, what, so, so talk about system failure, right? We're we have families and cultures. And what about even the system of adoption as a business and, uh, and helping families really navigate and understanding like what adopted children go through and what we internalize? And wouldn't it have been great? if someone uh, much earlier were able to help me understand that this was more complicated than your mother didn't want you. Of course, this was in the day of closed adoption. So we didn't have any information. And my adoptive family, you know, acknowledged they didn't want any information. 
you know, which was not in the service of an adoptee. Yeah. So many, many adoptees are experiencing that and trying to figure out, you know, as part of our search, it's like, why? Why didn't you keep me? And it's usually pretty complicated. Yeah. It's usually not boiled down to they didn't want me. So humans are very complex, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so diving into that, understanding that is can be can be pretty healing. And it doesn't mean that there isn't somebody in the family that didn't actually want you. I mean, sometimes that's that's true. And but there are reasons for that that are complicated and often steeped in some kind of trauma. Because we've we've gone from um we've gone from a feeling to a belief and what you know as you as you uh, put put it more correctly an internalized belief so we've we've a, a feeling somewhere along the somewhere along the line becomes um a, 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 an idea and then mm -hmm. that idea becomes a belief it's almost like so the metaphor i've used this one before uh, sorry i have used this one recently but it, it's a the, the it's a bit like a snowball right so when obviously we're doing this in the in the summer listeners um but in, in the winter we we go into the we go into our, into our, what we call a garden you sorry we call a garden you call a yard and we scoop up some we keep, we scoop up some snow uh, into like an egg shape between in our palms and then we kind of when we're kids we we roll that along the we we roll it along the ground right and, and 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 it picks up more and more snow and it becomes the the base for the snow person right because we're not allowed snowmen anymore or snow women right? yeah <laughs> So, it, it, the, the, uh, so, so, but that's how it kind of like it it, it. it seems to me that the feeling, a, a, a feeling, becomes shifts into a, a into an idea, and then the idea gains momentum, gets bigger like the snowball gets bigger, and before we know it. It, it's it's an internalized belief. Um, now that's obviously a, a, a lay a lay person's metaphor. Um, how would you put that more uh, professionally, without the use of snowballs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if a feeling creates a belief or belief creates a feeling. I don't know. Maybe a little bit of a chicken. Can an egg it. situation but I either way I think what then happens is that that feeling slash belief becomes you know self-fulfilling prophecy and then we take that that sentence of wounding whatever it is I'm not wanted I'm unlovable no one wants me um you know we all have our you know our little sentence and we take that and we apply it the situation and situation or we we test people um, to see if they really want us, you know, children do that for sure. Right. You know, we do that in relationships. Um, and then, you know, then it now becomes, it's a pattern. It's a pattern where we, um, continuously prove this belief is true. Yeah. I really am unlovable. And, you know, because we apply it to so, to so many things. And so, uh, hopefully then you get, you know, a good therapist or somebody that comes in there and says, no, no, no. That's not what's true. That's not what's true. That's that's a thought, and 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 you're unconsciously making it a reality. We don't know why this person did X, Y, and Z in your adult relationship. You know, there are there could be fifteen other reasons, not this one only reason that you carry and apply and interpret. Right? You know, we we interpret things for our woundings, right? This is one teaching I, I do with couples all the time. Like if you're not direct and clear about what's going on in an argument or a conflict or whatever's coming up, your partner is going to interpret your behavior through their wounds. So, you know, it's better to just say, you know, hey, I needed to cancel because I didn't feel well that night. I'd really like to spend time with you otherwise. 
if you don't say that, then your partner's gonna be like, well, why don't they want to be with me? Why, do, you know? So, so that's just a little example of how an adoptee could be taking this this thought and applying it everywhere. You know, relationships fail, and they, you know, they're acting out these behaviors that are, you know, pushing people away unconsciously, and then they're like, see, nobody wants me. Um, so there's a few different ways to go on that, um, and I'm gonna stick to that same same thing and talk about that in a few different ways because I think that different different ways of talking about stuff help different people. So the, the first one is I'm hoping I'm going to get another um, uh, another uh, brownie point from uh, from teacher here. <laughs> is this what we mean by confirmation bias? Is that what confirmation bias is? It is confirmation bias. It is. Um, we're looking for something to be true. We see it a certain way and we interpret it that way. And we're like, yes, that is true. Um, it's also a reenactment if we want to get, you know, real Freudian or psychodynamic. I mean, nobody's, nobody's really Freudian today, but, you know, we want to be psychodynamic about it. We're, we're reenacting a trauma consciously, you know, setting people up, you know, to, to abandon us and then saying, see, everyone, yeah. abandon, everyone abandons us. So I've, I've just realized one uh i've just realized when i did something like that myself uh i'm going back 30 years so i had a friend of mine lodging with me you know like in a spare room in the house and he paid for it was for peanuts the guy he, he was working it was he was working for mom and dad a low skilled work and he was getting you know a low skilled wage as i was getting at the time as well um and um he i he um Oh, I, I, I was going to a party and I and I, I I took some beer out of the fridge and it was his beer and he wrote he wrote me a snotty note and um, about you know and he hadn't paid for the beer because he was going out with a, a girl whose dad owned a huge distributor of beer you know they had a hundred mm. I mean, quarter of a million square foot of beer wine and stuff you know they were a, a, a distributor of booze. And so he hadn't paid for it, and he and he was like, he, he was living with me for, for for basically nothing, like fifteen pounds a week, so. and um, and and so I I I told him where to go. You know, I said if you if if that's where, <laughs> if if that's <laughs> you know, like, and and then uh, you know that's if, if that's why you feel about it, I think you you better find somewhere new to um, uh, new to live. So I'd obviously I was pushing him or pushing him away. Or testing him. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, so this uh, an, another way of thinking about this confirmation bias and and the other great world that, that you use was self fulfilling prophecy and and obviously the reenactment. Re yeah. Um, is uh, is a, this this is a metaphor? It's a snow metaphor. So at least we're consistent with the snow thing. Um, so basically, we we're going around with a pair of orange goggles on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going around with a pair of orange goggles and they make everything look orange. So we're going around with a pair of rejection goggles on. Yeah. Yep. And the, 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 the orange goggles make the snow look orange, not white, which is its true colour. And the rejection goggles make A, a letter about <laughs> nicking some yeah. boots. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. And to go back to your neuroplasticity point, um, how we ch we change that, um, we have to be willing to see it from, see these events from a different perspective. It's hard to do. That's why it is helpful to see a therapist or be in a group or have a mentor or somebody who can help you see it from a different perspective. The more that you do that, the less you're in that, you know, you think about, uh, when I think about neuroplasticity or patterning in our brain, you, you remember albums, you know, but we're old enough to remember actual records and albums. And if you play the, the same track over and over again, you know, that's like the abandonment rejection track, right? We need some help to be able to lift up the lever of the record player 
I don't remember what it's called, and you know, put it in a different track so we can see it a different way. And so the more you do that repeatedly, then you open up different patterns. So, um, so the perspective is one of my favorite words. So I'm love, I love the fact that you use that. But I was also going to ask you: Did you did you see um, Debbie Harry Blondie on um, uh, on on Glastonbury? Because she was my pinup. I didn't. I, I didn't. At, at yeah. Um, and but they had they had uh, um, that Elton John on as well. So it, it, it was like it was a everybody was over seventy at Glastonbury this year. Um, the uh, the um, but still banging out the same tracks off the same albums. Uh, so perspective, we normally talk about, we talk about you know, seeing the wood for the trees. Mm -hmm. A higher perspective. We've got a higher perspective. Another one I think about when I, a, a great metaphor I hear about, when I think about, hear about perspective, is that we see, so um, we see the same valley differently. Right, so the valley looks different as we climb up the valley side. It's the same valley. It's the same human experience, but our perspective has changed. We can see the wood for the trees. And clearly, as you say, you know, that's the whole point of therapy, isn't it? I guess it's one of the yeah, whole... Yeah, well, it's one, point, one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that person, that therapist, is going to uh, help us to going to see things from a different perspective mm -hmm. things from mm -hmm. a different perspective and when obviously the other thing is that when we see better we do better so what what kind of um, metaphors what 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 what, what else could you flesh out how else could you flesh out the word perspective in maybe a different way so people that don't get my strange mountain climbing metaphors might get it <laughs> Um, how would I flesh out perspective in a different way? Um, I mean, I, I think in terms of the the way that I work with adoptees is is to you know stay out of people's heads, right? You know, stop interpreting what other people are doing. You know, um, let's again back back with the uh, adoptee centered focus because we're we're not great at that. We need some help to stay, you know, in ourselves and what's going on with ourselves and not interpreting and looking about, you know, what other people are doing. So, you know, we, we do want a different perspective, but we don't want to be in other people's heads either, right? So, you know, how to do that and, you know, how to stay true to, you know, what are our needs? What is it that we need in this situation? How to communicate it? That's it, yeah. Um, and another, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about another word for perspective might help, and that was um, point of view. Like, point yeah. of, perspective is a point of view in a more uh, everyday language. The other thing that I thought about as well as you were talking about adoptee centric um, was actually back to a, a webinar that uh, that we did with an adoptive mum um, uh, who's in publishing. And we were talking about publishing our memoirs, and that sort of stuff. And and I think I somebody asked a question. One of the attendants on the webinar uh, asked a question about what they should write. And and I was like, and and they were going kind of different way. And and I said, no, well, you you write what you want to write. Yeah, right. Be, be, yes. Be, be you centric. Yes, be, it's your memoir. Yeah, it's, your memoir. <laughs> it's your book. You you, mm -hmm. you write it from mm -hmm. your perspective, and for your work, right? You, you, you right. write it for you. Write the book that you want to write. Don't write the book that somebody else tells you that you should write. Right. And and market it, promote it in the way that feels right for you, as well. And the reason why I think this is a big deal for for me is because i listened to somebody's advice on a, a like a, a business project years ago like probably 11 years ago and i thought i was going to do it my way and then somebody else suggested something and i just ran straight away and and, and, and implemented his idea uh, without thinking about it 
without weighing up the two. And I put a lot of money behind it and I wasted all that money. And I didn't do it my way. So we're now we're now we're, we've gone from Blondie to Frank Sinatra. We'd like do it our <laughs> way. Do it, our, do it, write your book, do it like yeah. your way. You know, do you do you write yeah, you know, write your poetry, do your adoption, do your adoptions focused art, do you find your therapist your way. Do it. Right. Right. I'm not a Frank Sinatra fan, so I don't know why I'm going on about that. Um, so I'm conscious of time. It's uh, mm -hmm. got, we've done an hour. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Anything that you'd like to share that I haven't given you a chance to talk about? Um, you know, just sort of like a, I think a, a closing message, I think that adoptees need to hear, you know, is um, maybe it could be used as an affirmation since we we're talking about affirmations, but you know, it's you belong, I belong. It's a, it's deep for us, you know, it, wherever we are, like we belong, we, and you know, we belong here, wherever here is alive on, on the earth, in your birth family, in your adoptive family, wherever, like, you belong. Yeah. So I'll do two responses to, to that. One is back to Glastonbury. It's like when, you know what Glastonbury is, right? You, well, it's um, a concert, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a festival. It's, a, it's, it's like- Yeah, okay, festival. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we, we belong. We, we, we sense that feeling of belonging. I have sensed that feeling. You kind of, you, you, the separate us, the ego, whatever, is lost in the crowd, isn't it? You know, you're, you're yeah. lost when you're watching your favourite band. You know, you're lost when you're um, in a good way, right? You, 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 you're, mm -hmm. you're part of, the, you're part of the, the gang. You've The belonging happens at a, a concert or at a, a, a game where you're a spectator or at another game when you're part of the team and you're, you're, you're in the zone, you're concentrating on your game and you're not worried about your prime or wound trauma you're in you're in the zone you're in the in the thing um, and um so that really touches i i feel uh, an incredible sense of belonging in those in those yeah. instances uh and um the other one the, the the profound one about belonging is is that is that quote from the French guy who says we're we're not we're not um, human beings having a spiritual experience. We are all one spiritual, mm. having seven having a human experience, having, having seven billion or eight billion human right. experiences. So at, at 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 the human level. We're, we're eight billion, but at a bigger level, we're all we're all all one. And mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing I was going to say was I, I, something hit me between right between the eyes about six months ago, which echoes what you just said. And it's um, what 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 if our destiny is right where we are? now and that just fried it yes, <laughs> yes. Whoa. Whoa. you know this yes. you're thinking i should i should i would it would be better if what 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 if our destiny was i'm getting the goose goosebumps on there i see that um what what if what if our destiny is right where we are Right. And it might be, you know, and I would add to that, you know, we're, we're, we are each responsible for our destiny and what we do with it. Our, you know, and that, as for an adoptee, that also means that our birth families and our adoptive families are responsible for their destinies and what they do with it. We're not responsible for their destinies. We're not responsible to heal other people's trauma to keep family secrets, to not make people uncomfortable. 
that's not our destiny, right? Cool, brilliant. Um, John, you've been the most smiley person I've had on the podcast. Right? <laughs> been smiling all Thank the you. way through you know like sometimes when you know we talk about I, I said pick your pick your own therapist your way do you know what I mean but like sometimes I see people and uh and I think like I I I, I want to work with somebody who I want to be like do, do you know what I mean yes that's a good point mm -hmm. I, yep and 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 some uh, they, I'm not talking about guests on, on this podcast listeners right I'm just talking about some people that you see on social media especially do, you know the, doing the Facebook adverts and you just think do, like do I trust that person do oh, I no. you know yeah. do, is that is that person um ahead of me on on the journey is they are they behind me on the journey do I really do do I want to credit this this the, this this person so uh but I I I, I love that I love what you just said about it's it's their stuff, it's their destiny. That's right. That's right. That's about us. So, uh, as always, listeners, I'd urge you to check out uh, Joanne's website and on socials find out what she's up to. You do? Do you do some group stuff? Am I am I getting that wrong? I don't know. Um, I am actually going to start a, an adoptee uh, group. So um, check out my website for information yeah. on that for anybody that's interested. Yeah. And is that limited in its geography? Like, because if you have the- Yeah, the yeah, unfortunately. So um, that would be for New York, Maryland, Florida, and Vermont um, until we get our counseling compact um, passed at the end of the year and then more states on that. Yeah. Okay. So from three thousand miles away, it's not something I can, I can join. <laughs> so thank you. Not, not now, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, listeners, and thank you, Joanne. It's been uh, an absolute joy. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate you having me on. Start. Thanks a lot, listeners. We'll speak to you very soon. Take care. Bye bye.